There's a deceptively simple problem that's tormented mathematicians for 50 years. Suppose you have a needle. What's the smallest area you can sweep out by rotating it in all directions? This may seem like a fun exercise in geometry, but by posing a similar question, researchers have uncovered a vast trove of mathematics. We're talking about the Kakeya conjecture, the first step in a tower of conjectures that form some of the biggest open problems in harmonic analysis, the study of the mathematics of signals and waves. Everything's resting on this Kakeya conjecture, so there's a chance if that's wrong, then the whole tower of implications kind of collapses, right? Everything fails. For decades, higher dimensional cases of the Kakeya conjecture have eluded the world's greatest mathematical minds. But in early 2025, two mathematicians published a once-in-a-century proof. In harmonic analysis, this is probably the biggest development in at least 20 years. You really try hard to, to not let yourself get carried away by the excitement. The result has profound connections to open questions about the behavior of the Fourier transform, differential equations, and much more. But what is the Kakeya conjecture? How did a problem about spinning a needle become a cornerstone of modern analysis and geometry? And what are some of the ideas behind the new groundbreaking proof? In 1917, Japanese mathematician Soichi Kakeya was pondering the geometric properties of space. He considered an infinitely thin needle on a desk. Spin it around and you get a circle. If you rotate it like this, you get a different shape, a deltoid, with an area half that of the circles. These shapes would come to be known as Kakeya sets. So the Kakeya problem is understanding how small these sets can be. Because they contain lines in every possible direction, we expect that they can't be too small. Russian mathematician Abram Besakovich became captivated by the Kakeya problem. Just two years later, he found a surprising answer. If you take a complicated set of U-turns, you can cover no space at all. He showed that, in fact, you can construct Kakeya sets that have arbitrarily small area, even zero area. This is quite counterintuitive. This is one of the sets that Besakovich created. How could the shape have a total area of zero? It seems that something about Kakeya sets are still large, just not in the usual sense of area. We need a different way to describe how the shape fills space. We need the notion of dimensionality. Dimensions describe how many independent directions or degrees of freedom an object has in space. A point has zero dimensions. A line has one. A plane has two. A cube has three. But it's also possible for shapes to have fractional dimensions. Some fractals, for example, have a dimension that's between 1 and 2. To study fractals, mathematician Hermann Minkowski defined a new notion of dimension that we now call the Minkowski dimension. The Minkowski dimension measures how many boxes of a given size are needed to cover a set. For this reason, it's also known as the box counting dimension. Say you have boxes that are each a tenth of a unit wide. Now you have a line segment of length 1 you'll need at least 10 boxes to cover it. But if you have a square of area 1, you'll need 10 squared, or 100 boxes to cover it. The Minkowski dimension is the value of this exponent. So the line segment has a Minkowski dimension of 1, because the exponent here is 1. The square has a Minkowski dimension of 2. But a fractal curve might have a Minkowski dimension between 1 and 2, because of the number of boxes needed to cover it. Later, mathematician Felix Hausdorff refined Minkowski's way of measuring the dimensions of irregular sets. We call this different formulation the Hausdorff dimension. Roughly speaking, it's the same idea as box counting, but whereas in box counting, all the pixels are the same size, you allow some regions of space to use big boxes and some regions to use small boxes. In the 1970s, mathematician Roy Davies began exploring the complicated, irregular geometry of Kakeya sets using these new approaches to dimension. He wondered, what's the smallest possible dimension for a Kakeya set? To see how we tackled the question, let's take each line segment and fatten it up a little bit. Your set now consists of extremely thin rectangles. Davies carefully calculated the area of the intersection between pairs of rectangles, depending on their angle. He then summed this quantity over all pairs of rectangles. He concluded that most pairs of rectangles have small intersections. This forces the union of all of the rectangles to be large and spread out in space. 
in effect, a geometric requirement that limits how much you can compress a Kakea set. Davies proved that every two-dimensional Kakea set has a Hausdorff and Minkowski dimension of two. These Kakea sets can have small area, but they have to be full-dimensional objects, so they have to be two-dimensional. By reframing the Kakea problem in terms of dimension, Davies laid the foundation for the Kakea conjecture, which generalizes his claim to all dimensions. It says that every Kakea set in n spatial dimensions must also have Hausdorff and Minkowski dimension n. In other words, a Kakea set must always have the same dimension as the space it inhabits, even if its area is zero. Intuitively, this makes sense. To have lines going everywhere, you need a lot of something. But while the statement may seem simple, mathematicians have struggled to prove it. Once you formulate the problem in a particular way, it really becomes about understanding how lines can intersect and cross over one another. That seems like a very elementary thing, but nevertheless, it's taken an immense amount of work to, to understand this problem. That same year Davies published his paper, Charles Pfefferman made a startling discovery that would transform the Kakea conjecture from a curiosity to a mathematical juggernaut. Pfefferman was working on the Fourier transform, a powerful tool from the field of harmonic analysis that allows mathematicians to study complicated signals or functions by writing them as sums of sine waves with different frequencies. The Fourier transform is a very fundamental concept in mathematics. It's basically ubiquitous. There are surprising connections where you wouldn't initially imagine the Fourier transform to play a role, but it nevertheless does. Here's what Pfefferman wanted to know. If you're given just some of your function's frequencies, can you reverse the Fourier transform to rebuild your original function? Mathematicians already knew how to do this in dimension one, but what about higher dimensions? So it seems very intuitive and natural that you could recover the function, but then Charles Pfefferman disproved it. And so this was a big surprise. So that was a really surprising result, but what was also surprising was the way he did it. He used the solution to the Kakea needle problem. In a shock to the mathematical world, there was suddenly an intimate link between harmonic analysis and the Kakea conjecture. So it was a fundamental new connection. It became increasingly clear that the path forward to solving these questions in analysis was, was to understand geometry. Many top mathematicians began to investigate Kakea sets, finding far-reaching connections to open problems in other fields. On top of the Kakea conjecture, they built a hierarchy of conjectures about the higher dimensional behavior of the Fourier transform and related ideas. On the first level is the restriction conjecture, which asks how the Fourier transform behaves when we look at it on a curved surface, like a sphere. Then there's the bochner reese conjecture, which asks whether we can use the Fourier transform to clean up and smooth out the edges of a signal without accidentally introducing noise or distortion. And at the very top is the local smoothing conjecture, a problem about differential equations. It's a deep question about how waves propagate in space. So there are very, very deep connections between the Kakea problem and propagation of waves. If the Kakea conjecture is false, then so are the statements above in the hierarchy. If it's true, then the methods used to prove it could also help attack the conjectures above it. It became increasingly important to understand this Kakea conjecture because it's part of a whole family of, of really difficult conjectures in many fields. In the decades following Davies's proof, Mathematicians set their sights on proving the Kakea conjecture in dimensions beyond 2D. The big difference is the family of different directions in three dimensions is much richer and much more complicated. And as a consequence of this, there's a lot of phenomena that occur in three dimensions that you don't really see at all in two dimensions. The 3D Kakea conjecture says that every Kakea set in 3D has Minkowski and Hausdorff dimension three. To understand what that means, let's return to the 2D Kakea set. Recall that Davies thickened these lines into rectangles. Now let's move into 3D space. If we pursue the same strategy, we get a collection of extremely thin tubes. In 2D, these lines often intersect. But in 3D, the tubes rarely intersect. They tend to miss each other. And in the Kakea conjecture, what you're trying to prove, what it really boils down to, is showing that if you have a collection of tubes pointing in different directions, then they can't intersect very much. It's not enough just to say you have many lines, but you have to have this special property that the lines point in different directions. And that turns out to be surprisingly difficult to actually exploit. 
you can't just consider one configuration. You have to consider all possible ways you can arrange these needles in different regions. And there's, there's an infinite number, basically, of all these configurations. And you want to show that every single one of these has to occupy a large amount of space. For a decade, Terence Tao and dozens of other mathematicians refined increasingly creative approaches to the problem. People were stuck for a long time. I spent many years working on this problem, but we were missing big chunks of the program. In 2022, Hong Wang and Joshua Zal joined the effort to crack the Kakea conjecture in 3D. First, they set out to prove that the conjecture was true for a subset of Kakea sets that mathematicians call sticky. This means that if two tubes are pointing in the same direction, then they also have to be located close to each other in space. This property makes the geometry of sticky sets more structured and predictable than non-sticky sets. If you assume stickiness, then you have a lot of information, like the, the set is quite rigid. Assuming stickiness is intuitively easier to prove. In 2022, the pair proved the conjecture was true for sticky sets. That was really strong evidence that they were closing in on the goal. They, they had handled the most difficult case of the problem, and then they needed some argument to also deal with the non-sticky case. Non-sticky sets exhibit an irregular geometry with tubes scattered in all directions. To tackle them, Wong and Zal started with a discovery from mathematician Larry Guth, who showed that any counterexample to the Kakea conjecture needed to have a special property called graininess. Graininess is a forced consequence of trying to compress all directions into a small Kakea set. The set develops small regions called grains, where many tubes overlap. And we spent quite a bit of time trying to understand how these grains interact with each other. Studying grains imposed a structure that Wang and Zal could exploit. They proved that grains from one part of the Kakea set could not have large intersections with grains from another part. Then they expanded their proof with an argument called induction on scales. There has been this dream to prove this Kakea conjecture by what's called induction on scales. It's a way to get from um, a to B when A and B are very far apart by just, just little steps. Previous attempts to prove the Kakea conjecture with the induction on scales had resulted in inefficiencies and losses. A classic example is the game Chinese Whispers, where you get a lot of people in a row and you, someone whispers a sentence to the next person who whispers a sentence to the next person. Um, if they had perfect reproduction, then by, then by induction, the person at the end would have exactly the, the same sentence as what they started with. But if you only have even a tiny amount of, of, of loss, in each transition step, then the end result can, can, be, uh, can be worthless, uh, or, or at least hilarious. Wang and Zal figured out that graininess was the key to controlling these losses. To understand how, recall that Kakea sets are irregular. At small scales, the tubes interact in unpredictable ways. For example, it's possible to imagine regions where the tubes overlap too efficiently, allowing a 3D Kakea set to squeeze into a smaller dimensional space. If this were to happen too much, the Kakea conjecture would be false. Instead of studying how tubes overlap, Wang and Zal analyzed grains. They showed that no point in space can lie in too many grains. This imposed a limit on how much the tubes could overlap and how much the set could be compressed. Wang and Zal used this structure to tame the chaos as they changed scale. And so you can slightly increase, with each time you run this argument, uh, your best estimate on the dimension of Kakea sets until eventually you get all the way up to three. They gradually raised the known lower bound on the dimension step by step until they proved the Kakea conjecture in Minkowski and Hausdorff dimension three. It's kind of the way math should work. Everyone contributes some partial result and it all gets synthesized at the end. So it's very satisfying. Mathematicians are hopeful that they can use the result to help build up proofs of the more ambitious conjectures above it. It doesn't fully solve the remaining questions, but it kind of knocks out half the difficulty. It's now given us a lot more confidence that all these beautiful conjectures we have, that they're going to hopefully be true. People are just going to start climbing this hierarchy. And I think one by one, these other conjectures are going to either be solved completely or we'll see a lot of dramatic progress. <laughs>